Hello, my name is Maury Crane, and I've been talking to Mr. Earhart Finkston from Iowa. He's the vice president of the National Farmers Organization, an organization that looks to many of us who read the newspapers to be the most radical grassroots organization uh, since the Grange in the 19th century to come out of um, the farm areas of America. Uh, you say radical. Uh would you also say that it is radical for people to want to solve their own problem, to get away from the reliance of others? Would well, you? I would say, uh, I, I guess I use radical not as a, as a nasty term. I certainly wouldn't do that in your presence. I use radical from the Latin word radix, which means root. I think people who, uh, who want to get to, uh, to the root of the disease rather than snip around the edges and, uh, uh, and this is what I had in mind. In that term, I agree absolutely with you, because that's exactly what we want to do. What I meant, of course, is, uh, as, as I understand it, I get it partially from talking to you, that uh, the NFO is the farm organization that wants to rely least um, on, uh, on the government as, uh, as the principal solving agent for farmers' problems. Yes, yes, that's right. We have, after all, been going to Washington for 35 years, asking them to solve our problem. I don't believe that anybody will claim that they're coming even close to it. We've lost our political influence. We're down now to 7% of the uh, voting population of the nation. And uh, we don't believe that uh, we'll get anything permanent out of, uh, out of politics. So we believe that if the farmer's ever going to solve his problem, he's going to have to face it himself and through mutual cooperation with his neighbors start running his business like other industries and raw producers of this nation are running their business, establish their own price. That's where the real problem lies, is in the price. What, what you really want is uh, to have uh, the bargaining agent, not the individual farmer, dealing with a great monolithic uh, uh, a meat packing industry or a, or a grain purchasing industry, but you want to have a large, a large seller of meat bargaining with a large buyer of meat rather than a, a small seller bargaining with a large buyer. Right. Buyers. In other words, get back to an equal basis where the bargaining power is on, on both sides is the same. And as you pointed out, you can't be equal when one side is highly organized and the other side is operating as individuals actually competing with each other. And this is what we're trying to establish is a mutual cooperation of farmers to work together towards pricing their production rather than going to the market and asking what will you give me and then after they're told to complain about what it is when they're doing absolutely nothing to get themselves a price. You know, uh, I come from a city and uh the first uh, that I had to do with uh, rural people in economics in any way was I used to go as a young man to farm auctions to purchase, uh, well, what I was looking for was for furniture, but people went to, to buy uh, garden equipment and so forth. And we would go there and, and the auctioneer would pit one uh, buyer against another uh, and sometimes one against one against one, but there were 18 people bidding, and then he would get his price up to a certain level, and then he would sell all 18 <laughs> at that price. He would act as if he had only one, you see. Obviously, you're, uh, uh, in buying, it's the same way. He's, he's got one farmer selling against another, but he's got to buy all the cows from all of them anyway. Uh, and um, I, I thought of this while you were talking, uh, if you had the kind of collective bargaining, I suppose, that the labor unions have, uh, you would say, see here, we can't work unless your factory is open. On the other hand, your factory can't open unless we work. Right. right. Uh, the thing that bothers me, Mr. Fingston, is um, as, a, as a city person, I, I've tended to think that uh, when I go to buy a side of beef now, if I do buy a hindquarter now at 63 cents a, a pound. First of all, I think you're getting the 63 and not the 20 you're getting. But uh, I remember buying a hind quarter regularly at 49 cents a pound. So what I used to pay in 54 and 55. And uh, I, with all my affection for you and for the NFO, I say, 
doggone those guys anyway. The farmers are getting rich. This is one of the things that disturbs us because we feel that the consumer is also being gouged. For example, within the last, uh, oh, let's say 18 months, there's a price drop of, oh, very nearly 10 cents a pound on this beef that you're talking about, yet on an average, the price that the consumer is paying has gone up. That's this is what has. disturbs me, that I'm not receiving it, yet the consumer is paying it, and I think it's about time that we recognize both ends. In other words, you're in a position now where I, as a farmer or producer, feeder, I go to the market, I ask them, what will you give me? They're in a position to pass their problem on to me. Yet, on the other hand, they don't sell it that way. They tell the customer how much they're going to, buy, uh, they're going to pay That's for right. it. So they're... Uh, they're I, buying at their price and they're selling at their you price. You betcha. Uh, and is there any wonder we're caught in a squeeze and the consumer, too, for that matter? I think we have a problem there that is of mutual interest to the consumer and the farmer. But generally speaking, the consumer is led to believe that he's paying an awful price because the farmer's getting too much. I think a few things maybe to point out is the meat price. We have gotten that down to pounds, cents per pound. Generally, we hear it in price per hundred weight, and that's not too easily for a lot of people to transfer to cents a pound, or price per quart of milk. For instance, the farmers in this area getting probably around seven, maybe at the most eight cents a quart, yet the consumer is paying what, 23, 24, mm -hmm. and he believes that the farmer is getting enormous amount. Yet the people in between there, between the farmer and the consumer, are getting almost twice as much for just handling it as the farmer gets for producing the cow, milking her, feeding her, cooling that milk, getting it to the place where it's finally distributed, and for all of his effort, he gets about half of what the consumer, or not even half of what the consumer is paying. In other words, the other interests from there on are receiving more. Now, it might be that they need that. I won't condemn that. But I do condemn the fact that each time that anywhere along the line there's an increase needed in margin of profit, or uh, let's say higher costs developed there someplace that they're always passed back to me and that my price has to go down because my prices are going up just exactly the same as everyone else's is. Yet I am today selling my farm products for prices that I received in the 30s, let's say 12, 13 years ago. When your expenses were and less than half. And my expenses, yes, yes. Less, much less than half. Uh, Farm labor, I suppose, surely must have doubled if you can find it. Yes, farm labor has doubled, although, let me say very much, uh, farm labor is not what's gouging us. They're, uh, they're, they're in producing. Trou they're in trouble, oh, 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 too. They? Yes, they're, they're oh. far underpaid as compared to the rest of the economy. Yet, uh, I have absolutely no way of paying more for it. So the man that works for me, no, he is not receiving. Uh, but he's in, he as, he's in as much trouble as you yes, are, yes, except is. that he doesn't have the investment. You can go out and uh, uh, buy cattle on the hoof to feed, uh, you, and when it comes time to sell them, you have no choice but to sell. You have, there is nothing you can That's do right. with a full-fed cow, and you sell it at a price that you have... Now, you, you wouldn't no think... No part in setting. You wouldn't think, in, in even as... As uh, a doctor in the university, you wouldn't think of working all year to find out at the end of the year whether you were going to be paid yeah, at yeah. all, would you? Or you wouldn't ask that of a working man or any anyone else. Yet this is what is being asked of the farmer. Now, getting back to this cattle situation, not only did the cattle feeder last year work all year for nothing, but he's actually being told that he's going to have to bring 50 to $80 for every head that he did feed, he's going to have to pay that for the privilege of having fed it. That's his loss. He doesn't only get paid, he, does, he, he has to take some of the earnings from the year before to come to get rid of his stock at that time. It's as if you had the cows as company for dinner and you put on a spread. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to let you get away, uh, Mr. Finkson, with uh, the comparing of a, a man on salary, as I am at the university, with uh, the farmer, because you're, you're in uh, an, an enterprise. Um, I worked in construction business, and a man in construction frequently does precisely what you do. He bids, <clears throat> and he may work an entire year, and at the end discover he has lost a few thousand as well as gained a few thousand. I think a man in manufacturing does this too. 
<coughs> I think the real difference, though, is the man in construction is in a position to pass uh, his expenses along to the consumer much more easily. Now, if I can get into the same position that the man in construction is in, I'm satisfied. That's all you want. That's, That's what, what I want. Wants. You betcha. So <coughs> I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not complaining about that at all because he is in a position where, see, that he, he can, uh, in advance, before he does it, he can determine, well, this is what I think it's going to cost me to produce. I have basis of figuring that, and I'll do the job for this amount. Then if I misfigured, if I failed, or I don't produce as well as I should, I am willing to take that. But I don't want to produce on the basis of someone else determining for me exactly what they're going to pay me, completely disregarding what my costs are. Our costs don't enter into the market. The farmers go to the market, we say, what will you give me? The cons uh, the, not the consumer, but the, my customers your, who are the your processing. Customer, there's only two or three people. That's right. It's, it's in a very highly concentrated area now to where a few people can determine the price that's going to be paid on all of it. Now, I don't want to be in a position where they determine that this is the margin of profit that they need, therefore I'm going to have to do without or I'm going to have to sacrifice 60 or $80. I want to know in advance what I'm going to get for that. And this is the program of the NFO to place the farmer in a position to establish his prices on the basis of what it costs to produce and then contract a year ahead at least and then produce for that contract. So I'm trying to get myself into the position that the construction, the man in construction is well, in. Well, this makes more sense to me than it ever has before. Obviously, there must have been a time in history when there wasn't a need for an NFO, when there were lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, purchasers that you could go to and you could play them off against each other the way they play the producer. The pro well, just, just for instance, <coughs> in the days when my father was going to the market and asking, as I do today, what will you give me, the situation was completely different. At that time, let's take the retailing industry, for example. They weren't organized like they are today. Mm -hmm. At that time, the retailing industry was in the hands of family-type businessmen, just exactly as the farms right. are still today in the hands of family-type farmers. Now, at that time, the packer wasn't in the position that he is today where he had to pass it back to us. The prices are being mm -hmm. dictated to the packer that he's going to receive. Then if he's going to stay in business, he has to pass them on to the farmer. He has no other way to go. But in the days when my father was doing the same kind of marketing that I am, the retail businessman wasn't in the position to dictate any price to the packer. The packer was at that time able to run his business in a business-like manner because he could pass the margin of profit he needed on to the people that he was selling to and eventually to the guy that is consuming it. But is it the retailer who sets the prices now? Yes, you betcha. And that's because there are only a few over, retail chains. Yeah, w over 80 percent, see, of all of uh, my meat production, for example, is being retailed through the chain stores. So this mm -hmm. has come now to where just the buying power li lies in the hands of a very few people. They tell the packer how much they're going to pay. If the packer wants to stay in business, he's got to accept that offer. He's no better off than we are in that mm -hmm. respect, except that he's got us down there as the fall guy to pass his profit on. But I have, have no place to pass. you don't have anybody now, except those poor fellows who work for you, and you're sorry for them. I suppose the well, packer is Well, I think is them we are clipping to the limit now. You're clipping, and I suppose, I suppose somebody at... Uh, uh, a meatpacking house says of Finkston, the way Finkston says of his employees, poor guy, I really like him. And, and the amazing thing is, the man who sits in the city, having sat in a city all of his life, as I have, is told that there are fewer, fewer, fewer family farms, that the farm, uh, uh, don't let this fellow fool you, it's a very big place that a man can't start a family farm in Iowa or Indiana or Michigan today without tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a great big thing. It's a big chain store. It's a big packing house. And it's a big farmer. And uh, don't st start feeling sorry for them because that's elephants fighting against elephants. And when the elephants fight the elephants, it's it's only the spectators who get trampled. This is, this is the trend, see, and what we're often being told is what we're going to have to do is to get so big, see, and as they usually refer to it, that fewer people are slicing the pie. But all you have to do 
is look at the figures and take what's projected for this year. This year, the American farmer, if the projection holds out that he receives between 11 and a half, 12 billion dollars as net income, that means that he's going to receive 5% investment, 11.4 uh, would be exactly, 5% on, uh, on his investment and not one he's blessed penny for the work neighbor. that he's going huh? to do. Now, if there's something rotten in that situation... Wow! Now, you you're can being get 5% and five do nothing five, by going right, to building a loan. Right. I can loan it to my neighbor and watch him work yeah. all year, actually come out better, because he'll pay me 7% for that money. That's and right. Watch and him you, won't, do the work. you won't be using any arnica either. You won't be putting any money into... That's minimum. right. Now, on this expansion, the debt in Ameri on American agriculture is the largest in history going up by leaps and bounds. Obviously, the farmer doesn't have the money to expand on his own, so he borrows. Now, it costs us anywhere from, well, the cheapest money that I know of that I could possibly borrow would cost me five and a half percent, and that'd have to be on a farm mortgage. Any money I used to operate on or even buying cattle would cost me six and a half percent upward. Finance equipment, 12 to 18 percent. How can I expand my operation or pay that pay, say, an average of 7% interest on money that's going to return me five. Can you think of a quicker way to go broke than that? And absolutely nothing for well, the than I'm going to do. this is a society in which it's very easy for people, cities and small towns and uh, farms to borrow money. Everybody's willing to lend. Uh, I have uh, ex-students who are farmers because I'm involved in teaching uh, at a uh, land-grant university. And I'm visited regularly by ex-students who are farmers because I'm here in the state capital where they come to politic and where they come to borrow money. And I have young boys in their mid-twenties who have $40,000, $60,000 worth of debt. And uh, as a matter of fact, they, <coughs> they consider this is what they are worth. Evidently, borrowing is no trick. And, and perhaps that's why the, the farmer is, is deeper in debt today than ever before. Well, this, this is where the farmer is confused. He's confusing, actually, credit with income today. If their credit's cut off, uh, oh, this would be a miserable situation. Now, let me make one thing clear, too, here, so I'm sure that I don't want to uh, cast the wrong impression. I am not condemning any lending agency. Yeah. I am not condemning the people that buy my production for the way they're operating mm -hmm. their business because I think they are operating a business the way it should be operated. But the man you're not, I'm but condemning the farmer. He's not running a business. That. He's That's not right. running a he's business. He's acting like a <coughs> dummy. He's actually a panhandler in mm -hmm. the market and then complaining about the prices that he's receiving where if he continued to do what actually built our nation, the very basis of our nation was the cooperation with each mm -hmm. other. This is the basis of our government, of our democracy. This is what I'm asking the farmer to do. Is but to he does it. And lots of, uh, uh, before the show, we were talking about the, the grain elevator. We were talking about the cheese co-op. Uh, farmers with fiercely independent natures uh, are aware that in, in many areas there, there's a demand for equipment, there's a demand for talent that no, no man can do for himself. And so he's... He's really habituated, the farmer, American farmer thinks in terms of, uh, of cooperatives, in everything, I suppose, but what? Economic self-interest. That's right, but uh, the idea, I think, was there originally. I think it's, it's largely the, uh, the, what brought about the co-ops was this idea that we're involved in. But the problem with it is it's a little area here, it's a little area here, it's a little area there, there's no coordination at all. This is why we're developing the National Farmers Organization program over a nation. You see, it doesn't do, let's say the fellows in this area in dairy, it doesn't do them a bit of good how well they're organized in this particular area if they all agreed 100%, let's say in a county or two counties or 10 counties. If the milk can come in from somewhere else around them, if the farmers in my area, if my home area, if they'd completely disregard them, that doesn't mean a thing they'll be sidestepped. This is why we're developing a national organization. You might call it a national cooperative, bringing the farmers together to go down one goal, you see, so that it cannot be brought in and establish the bargaining power in an organized manner so that we can establish a price on the basis of our cost and then contract for it. But uh, the, the interesting thing, uh, I think the thing that uh uh, differentiates, gives the unique characteristic to the NFO as opposed to 
uh, the other uh, organizations, good as they are in the country, is that uh, you're not organizing as a pressure group. You're not organizing to ask somebody to do it. You're organizing uh, along the lines of, uh, of the National Association of Ma Manufacturers or the American Federation of Labor uh, saying uh, we're not asking the government to do it. We're not asking a regulatory agent. Yeah. We're going to do it ourselves. Are you in all 50 states now? No, we're organized in 23 states. And these of are, the nation. These we are, are the, the primarily grain and, and cattle producers. Well, we, we've started out in the area. The organization was developed in Iowa, but had its foundation in Iowa and Missouri, basically. And the original idea was to get the 10 state area that produces roughly about 75% of the corn, the fed cattle, the hogs, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've gotten far beyond that 23 states now of course the greater the more area we cover if we get all commodities we want to work on all commodities uh, but you have basically the bulk oh yes of, by of, far of, the great uh, bulk the, uh, the uh, wheat and the and the the grain and the uh, meat now uh, producing states are uh, with uh, people who have agreed to cooperate uh, not to accept suicidal prices. Right, right. And so it amounts to largely an educational program is to point out to the farmer what is happening to him, getting him to realize his problem, and then getting a desire built in him to cooperate with his neighbor to uh, formulate a program that will establish the prices through contract, a prices based on the cost of production and then produce for that contract. Then, of course, we use a holding action with it, which is probably the most misunderstood part of our program. I wish you'd talk about that. Okay, oh well. Uh, actually, a lot of people believe that, that is, the holding action is the program. It isn't. Mm -hmm. Contracting is the program and establishing our price. But in order to do it, you have to have bargaining power. And in other words, you can't go contract with anybody until you can be in a position where you can make the fellow realize that it's better for him to do business with you than not to do business with you. In other words, you have to be in a position to not deny him that production mm -hmm. if he doesn't uh, want to cooperate and is opposing your fair prices. Now, even when it's understood to that extent, there's still a lot of people who misunderstand it. They seem to think this is something new, it's something different, and yet it's not nothing different than it's being done up and down every main street in mm -hmm. America every day. For instance, your merchant, he establishes his price on the basis of what it costs him to produce. He adds to that cost the margin of profit that he has, then he establishes a price on the merchandise in his store. And from that point on, he'll use a holding action. If you walk in, you don't want to pay his price. You don't get the merchandise. You leave her right there, see? So he uses the holding action every day. In fact, so do your professional men, uh, your dentists, lawyers, or from, for that matter, this television station. They've got a price set for the time that they sell their advertising. The Not adver this station, but other stations. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> other stations then. So we don't you, advertise. You need to get, oh, you we don't, don't advertise. advertise. Oh, this, this is, is, this is oh, a university. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, but that's quite true. The point uh, I'm if, trying if to make. If a person says, uh, uh, I'd like to buy $50 worth of time for $46, the station says, go away. Yeah. This is the point you're trying to make. Well, you might do it if it's agreeable with you, but he still bargains with you in a sense, or would bargain with, let's say, uh, a station that does sell advertising on the basis. It's agreeable between the two persons. It's not a matter that the guy that wants the time comes in and says, look, that's too much here. You run it. Yeah, oh. And uh, you give you 20 bucks for that. We don't have any cattle dying on the hoof either. Yeah. You're, you're in a very, very tight squeeze. A man who sells a hammer for a dollar and refuses to sell for 96 cents until he thinks about it doesn't have to feed the hammer. All he has to do is store it. Yes, Isn't this your problem? No, I tell you, I think we're actually in a better situation even than the man is with the hammer. Now, since we're talking about meat, actually 11% of all of the meat consumed in the United States is being imported. And there's only one reason why it's being imported. The American farmer just plain isn't producing enough meat to feed the people of this nation what they want. Is that right? 11% is being imported. From, from Australia and Argentina, I assume. Austra Australia, New Zealand, basically, uh -huh. and then there's other countries. Argentina does yeah. some importing, but Australia and New Zealand are the big ones. But the point I'm making is that we're not even producing the meat to feed this nation. 
Now, part of our program is to use the resources that God gave us in the manner in which he intended to be, them to be used, and that is to produce food to feed the people. Now we're actually taking food away from other parts of the world, from people that are hungry, bringing it in here where we're retiring our own resources. So part of our program constitutes reestablishing or re uh, taking back the markets that we've lost in meat, for instance. Once we're well enough organized, get enough farmers together that the farmer can tell the packers who, uh, how much they're going to pay for the live animals, we're also in a position to tell them who they're going to buy them from. But first, we've got to produce them in this nation here. In other words, I'll be in a position to ask the packer at that time, now, which do you want? the meat here in the United States that we produce, or you want to go on with the cow meat that you're importing? He's out of business if you don't get our meat uh -huh. or can't get any ours. In other words, we're able to reclaim that market once we're producing it. I reclaim, uh, you indicated there was a time when all meat eaten in the United States was locally produced. Yes, basically uh, ahead of 1948, we were producing all of the meat. meat. Uh, yes, of course, we had rationing too, uh -huh. keep that in remembrance. Oh, but yeah, but we did, we had it for only the last, uh, not all of that. Uh, rationing started what in 42? Uh, 42 to about 48. Uh -huh. In 48 we started importing and the uh -huh. imports have been increasing constantly since that time till today we're importing 11 percent. Now the, uh, the point I was going to make in connection with producing that, see the market is here but we, we're not producing it to take advantage of it. We're in no position to supply it even at the present time. Now, if we just recaptured that market, look what that would do for our nation here. Mm -hmm. Because now we're paying to retire acres. We're not producing that here. We're going instead someplace else and bringing it in here. Doesn't make now, any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. So if we were going to just produce, let's say, the meat that the people of these, this nation want, that they'd like to buy if we produce them, that would require 11% more grain, it would require 11% more roughage, and with the methods that we're using farming today, if we put every single acre that's out there in the country that's lying idle now, being retired, it could not possibly produce the additional 11% of grain and 11% of uh, roughage unless that we decidedly intensified mm -hmm. our methods of farming. In other words, it's there, see, and yet, Possibly you read a few uh, weeks ago, it appeared, I think, in most papers, where Argentine government was asking their people to do without meat in two more days a week so that they could export still more. See, actually, the people of other parts of the world are being robbed, bringing it in here. And it isn't even price competitive, according to the yellow sheet, which is the broker's, uh, let's say, guideline. Uh -huh. On the west coast, this cow meat's coming in for 37 to 40 cents a pound. On the east coast, coming in at 40 cents a pound. And this is the same kind of meat that our farmers right here are selling on the hoof for 12 cents a pound, or at the most 14, mm. see? But yeah. it's just plain. We've let somebody else run our business, or let's say them finally might even get down. Isn't anybody running it? We're just there's, letting it there's drift. No, there's nobody running the store. It seems to me if we had 11% more U.S. production, uh, there'd be, the farmer would have 11% more money to spend when he went into town, when he went sure to the store, he'd buy, he he'd buy equipment, he'd buy automobiles, and he'd... Uh, not too long ago, a newspaper editor in western Iowa handed me a clipping out of his paper when I went into a meeting to speak. He runs a column 10, day, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And the reason this was interesting is because it was on meat. And in his column 10 years ago today, he pointed out that uh, two farmers in that particular area in western Iowa had topped the Omaha market with hogs. They had received 26.75 for their hogs. This was just 10 years ago. And what does he get now? About, uh, oh, 13, 14, something like that. Oh, my goodness. Well, this, this, is, thing, this, thing. this is the best argument I can see for the National Farmers Organization. I wish I had another half hour and uh, 10 more to talk to you, Earhart Flinkston. Thank you so much for being on Conversation. Yeah, yeah. My friend.